16 by 9, the bigger picture. He's, uh, he's obviously very disappointed for not winning the gold medal. The lows are always lower than the high. Life has kicked you as a team and tried to bring you down. And stomped me on the backs of the legs and, <laughs> um, yeah, lots. That's all coming up on 16 by 9. Here's Mary Garofalo. Good evening and welcome to 16 by 9, The Bigger Picture. There was a time when the name Sean O'Sullivan was on the lips of just about every Canadian. A boxing superstar who won a silver medal at the 1984 Olympic Games and earned Golden Boy status. He was once voted Canada's top athlete, surpassing even Wayne Gretzky. But what happened to this national hero? Well, in his first television interview in almost two decades, Sean O'Sullivan sits down exclusively with 16 by 9 to reveal some stunning, never-before-told details about his life. We watched anxiously as he ran towards us at this footbridge in Belleville, Ontario. The boxer was walking his boxer, Tony. Are you my old friend? It has been 25 years since I first interviewed the famous Sean O'Sullivan. Now 47 years old, Sean's Irish choir boy looks haven't faded. And at this reunion of sorts, it became painfully clear that although Sean has left boxing, the effects of boxing have not left Sean. Someone succeeded in trying to stay in the same pants size, and that's very good. <laughs> A wounded survivor of this tough sport, today, Sean O'Sullivan is a little older, a little grayer, but just as charming. I wanted to shave my head. Since fading into the limelight, there have been many rumors about Sean O'Sullivan. Is there brain damage? Does he have a drinking problem? And did he really work as a janitor at a school? And for the first time, Sean sits down with 16 by 9 to set the record straight. The lows are always lower than the high. And the highs made Sean O'Sullivan a star, captivating us all. The proverbial boy next door, whose powerful punch put Canada on the map. To be honest with you, I want Canada to feel proud. Born into a staunchly loyal Irish Catholic family, Sean grew up in Toronto's East End, the seventh child of Rita and Michael O'Sullivan. Sean, the baby of the family, needed to make his mark. What made you go into that ring? It was just an opportunity to do something better than my brothers. Uh, growing up the youngest of, of a bunch of boys, uh, you're never fast enough, you're never smart enough, you never say the right thing, you, you can't lift enough uh, because they're bigger than you. And at 16, Sean walked yeah. into the Cabbage Town Boxing Club and never looked back. Peter Wiley would become his trainer. A very courageous individual, was di very disciplined, and damn it, was a good, good fighter. He would never quit. You've got to protect yourself, keep your hands up. Stardom came fast and furious in 1981. At the tender age of 19, Sean defeated Cuban Olympic gold medalist Armando Martinez to win the gold medal in the World Amateur Championships. And then the big moment. At 23, Sean O'Sullivan represented Canada at the Olympic Games in Los Angeles, a moment that would catapult him into sports megastardom, making him a media darling. The kid had power. Look at O'Sullivan open up. Tell me about the rounds leading up to it. What were you going through? I had, uh, in total, I boxed five times in about 12 days. My first match. Uh, can you edit this? <laughs> it was at this point in the interview that we saw how boxing may have taken a toll on Sean O'Sullivan. He admits his memory loss is becoming a bigger problem, and we watched as he struggled to remember one of the biggest highlights of his life. Who did I boss against? Huh. But tucked deep in his memory, the pain of losing the gold medal match against American Frank Tate. I had given them two standing eight counts, almost knocked him out. Didn't happen, that's fine. <laughs> um, thought, thought that I had done enough to merit uh, a yay as opposed to a nay. Um, ultimately, it came down as a nay. 
<laughs> and I didn't, I didn't get the, the, the winning nod. Oh, I don't believe it. Sean had just won the silver medal, but you'd never know it by the crowd's reaction. In front of the entire world at that moment, Sean embodied the meaning of the words, playing with heart. Sean O'Sullivan now at ring center, receiving a standing ovation. After the fight, the crowd were cheering for him and not for Frank Tate. Frank Tate's girlfriend even admitted that Sean had beat him that night. He's, uh, he's obviously very disappointed for not winning the gold medal. It was, um, it was a great time. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't trade it uh, for anything. Uh, well, maybe, maybe I would now. Sean came home a national hero. He was loved and applauded by prime ministers, other fellow athletes, and just about anyone who laid eyes on him. Have you heard about the big strong man? He's Sean O'Sullivan. Have you heard about the gold medal fight? Well, oh, what a hell of a fight. And you almost immediately, Sean decided to turn pro. He admits it changed his life, and not for the better. It sort of had now became a business and a job. The game got to be um, rough, tiresome. At 26, you were married, right? Married a girl I uh, met in church. Um, have now made uh, five children uh, that I'm responsible for. Was there pressure for you to make a very good living at this? I mean, what were you getting paid per matches? There were lots of um, $80,000 to $110,000 type, type um, paydays. By the time the pros came to life, um, I was interested in the bottom line. How much am I getting paid? I didn't care if it was fight number 17 or fight number 20. Um, what's the venue? Uh, what's the, the, the seat count? And how much am I going to make? Because of his personality and his character, I really don't think he was made for, for professional boxing. Because you have to be not only a great fighter, but you also have to be an entertainer in the business. And he wasn't that kind of person. And Sean was taking his hits, not knowing the damage it was causing his brain. And in an incredible admission, he says one day he woke up and he was blind. Um, I never told anyone that. No, you know what? Um, my left eye was blind. And my right eye was um, uh, on the line. The nature of it so far has come as a surprise. After the break. And for the first time in a lot of years, they shake your hand and pat you on the back and say, good luck, kid. Go do something else. That's next. We're back with the bigger picture. He was a bona fide Canadian celebrity and a perfect role model in a less than perfect sport. Sean O'Sullivan was a boxing legend who one day just faded away, leaving behind his fans, his friends, and even some of his family. Tonight, Sean tells us what happened in his own words. It was the punch that knocked Sean O'Sullivan into retirement, a bout that would mark the start of a very difficult period in O'Sullivan's life. Having suffered a big loss to Donovan Boucher, a boxer from the same Cabbage Town Boxing Club and trained by the same man who stood in Sean's corner at the Olympic Games, Peter Wiley. I guess I caught him in the right spot. I won that fight, you know. It was, a great, it was a great night for me, you know, it could, have been, it could have been me in Sean's shoes right now. It was a tragic situation, I thought, and, it, and, and it, to me it was the end of his career in boxing. We talked to each other in the dressing room and we resolved that uh, he would go out to the press conference and announce his retirement and that was it for boxing. I remember getting up and I thought, oh yeah, huh, I got, I got nothing to do today. And, uh, <laughs> uh, then the next day came, and he still didn't have nothing to do. And the next day came, and the fifth and tenth and thirtieth and hundredth day came, and you didn't have nothing to do, because your life had been for the last number of years guided um, by a sport. 
dictated to you by a coach or someone to how to be and how not to be. And for the first time in a lot of years, um, they shake your hand and pat you on the back and say, good luck, kid. Go do something else. Okay, now what? And and the now what became the focus of Sean's existence. His family made sure he was equipped with an education. He even attended classes at the University of Toronto. Yet Sean says he felt lost. What did you do? Tell me some uh, of your jobs. Well, I renovated homes, um, painted homes. Call, called uh, a policeman, a friend of mine. He got back to me and said, uh, Here's the name, here's the number, uh, call him, do you have work boots? What was the job? Being a janitor. It was, uh, so the, the, the steel toe shoes uh, were in the warehouse uh, and it was working, just cleaning up. Uh, again, uh, it, it immediately gave me a, a medical and dental plan um, uh, and a pretty decent uh, salary. The pressure of becoming a mere mortal again, out of the media spotlight, became too great. And in the early 90s, Sean O'Sullivan decided to come out of retirement, determined to prove he still had his fighting Irish fists. What was your first rematch after that, uh, coming out of retirement? That would be in the Catskills. I mean, it, it paid bills. Uh, you, you, you never made home run, home run paychecks. Then what happened? How'd you end up back home again? Came home uh, from the Catskills um, with a few uh, medical uh, necessities. I never told anyone that. No, you know what? It is something he never told his family, friends, even his trainer. His secret? He had been boxing with little to no vision until one day when he woke up and he was blind. Um, my left eye was blind. And my right eye was um, uh, on the line. I uh, had developed uh, cataracts in uh, both my eyes. Was it, it was, because of the boxing? Yeah, there was evidently trauma uh, to the eye. Sean says he came back to Toronto and was operated on immediately, restoring some of his vision. But instead of hanging up the gloves, he says he foolishly went back into the ring for more poundings. Even after everything you went through, you went back in that ring. And yeah. did you go in that ring with any kind of hesitation? No, that I wasn't um, scared at all. But a CAT scan of his brain would change all that. In a mandatory procedure required yearly in order to have his boxing license renewed. In 1996, Sean was given a frightening prognosis. The CAT scan, uh, it showed abnormalities. Sean says there was brain damage and the neurologist refused to renew his boxing license officially ending his boxing career. Were you angry? No. Were you? No. I was sort of saying, foo, foo. Like, thank God. Thank you, buddy. You finally said, you don't have to do this anymore. Sean eventually moved his wife and five children to Belleville, Ontario, a three-hour drive north of Toronto. But it wasn't long after that his marriage would abruptly come to an end served with divorce papers he knew nothing about. He was a nice guy. He, he said, uh, God, Sean, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm so, sorry to bring you this. And he handed me this envelope. I said, oh, thank you. Said, what is it? He said, well, I said, I, I, I think it's divorce papers. <laughs> I said, wow, OK. Um, he said, are you OK with it? And I said, well, um, I may as well be. I guess it's a case of somebody doesn't want me. Today, Sean lives alone with his dog, Tony, in this house. He admits he is estranged from his once close-knit brothers and sister. His father, Michael, suffers from Parkinson's disease, and his mother, Rita, is now deceased. And there is also the physical pain from years of being hit. That's it. That's the right hand that did it. Just getting through a day. Um, Hoping to God you're able to walk that day or your hands and shoulders aren't killing. Um, 
and then there's memory things. I mean, there's a ton of a ton of ball that, that I juggle every day that I know most never ha ever have to bother with. Like trying to remember something? Uh, unless you write it down, I've forgotten it. And uh, I don't have a pen, a pen today. <laughs> uh, yeah. Is that uh, frustrating for you? It's annoying, uh, but you, you, you just learn to manage it. That's all, you, you just manage it. Are you working? How are you making money? Uh, there is a league of sort of late 40s to 75 ballpark age, late 40s and above, um, called Dragon Boating, within which um, the three years that I've been with them and helping them train, um, they've won two world championships. So I am. Um, so are you making a living out of this? Oh, it, 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 it pays the rent and feeds Tony and. Have you retired with all kinds of money? <laughs> uh, no. Um, no, I, I, I've retired um, with a, a, lot, a lot of fond memories, a lot of trophies, um, things, a lot of memorabilia. And now even some of that is gone. Sean suffered a final blow when burglars broke into his apartment and stole 10 irreplaceable sports rings. The very first ring was one that I got from Prime Minister Trudeau. I didn't know who would or could or had the desire to do this. Life has kicked you in the teeth and tried to bring you down. And stomped me on the backs of the legs and, <laughs> um, yeah, lots. Coming up on 16 by 9. I would have to say, frankly, that I was assaulted by the police. That's next. Welcome back to 16 by 9, the bigger picture. He fought his way through life as a champion boxer, but Sean O'Sullivan never pictured himself going a few rounds with cops. It was another setback for this once boxing great who says he has pictures to prove what police did to him. And a warning, some of these photos are graphic. At first glance, you'd think you were looking at photos of Sean O'Sullivan after one nasty pro fight. This was one nasty fight, all right, but according to Sean, it wasn't in the ring. It was right outside his house with Belleville police. I would have to say, frankly, that I was assaulted by the police. What triggered this incident with police was for months now, Sean has been searching desperately to locate Olympic memorabilia stolen from his apartment. Ten irreplaceable sports rings, one given to him by Pierre Elliott Trudeau. They're not worth nothing um, except that which they're worth to me. He says he recently got a tip that one of his neighbors might have some information about his stolen rings. But Sean says when he made his way to his neighbor's door, he looked up, saw me, um, and then li literally ran at me from his back deck um, and punched me. So I thought, okay, fine, you, you idiot. You didn't hit me. I hit you. And I did. Police were called, and things only got worse. They twisted my arms to a degree that they probably shouldn't. They threw me on the ground. Sean says the next thing he knew, he was being tasered. I said, why are you doing this? I haven't resisted you guys once. One of the officers um, grabbed me by the back of the hair and slammed my head down on a, a wooden block, um, cutting all of my forehead. Police charged Sean with assault and mischief. Mr. O'Sullivan showed signs of intoxication and was in an agitated state. We contacted Belleville police to find out what happened. They would not take any questions or allow us to interview them. Throughout the arrest, he was physically resistant. Sean says police claims he was drunk are not true. He says because he suffers from what is called boxer dementia, or more commonly known as being punch drunk, he is often mistaken for being intoxicated. That's a, a medical term um, given to, to, to fighters, boxers, who have had um, brain damage that, that, that is quite evident. And do you think you're in that category? Yeah, I probably suffer from it. 
and there have been other minor run-ins with the law. Sean says he was convicted in 2002 for assaulting his then-wife and also for possession of an illegal substance. That substance was a very small quantity of marijuana, which he claims he uses to help relieve his constant physical pain. He says these are some of the reasons why he faded out of the limelight. This former boxing great says he hasn't walked into a ring for years. So we took him back to where it all started, the Cabbage Town Boxing Club. Well, there you are. I see you. Watching Sean was like watching someone who was meeting up with an old friend he didn't really want to see. Huh. Good to you. But it was obvious, even after so many years away from the limelight, Sean is still a star. Well, it's um, it's great, great to know. Uh, if only uh, some of the bills could get covered by that. <laughs> he says he didn't have the heart to watch the Olympic torch come through Belleville, knowing he would not be part of the Olympic moment. Would you have liked to? I, I would have loved to. Have, yeah, yeah, I would have. I would have loved to. It is missed moments like this that have angered those who love Sean the most. Uh, a person of his magnitude, an unbelievable image for um, amateur sports in Canada, and him not to be recognized uh, when we have the Olympics here in Canada, embarrassing. That kid had power. Today, all Sean has left are his memories. But despite the toll of this sport that made him famous, has taken on his body and mind. He speaks no ill about it. No. No? I'm, uh, I, I still am in support of boxing. Really, I am. Again, you and me wouldn't be talking here now if that game called boxing wasn't in existence. This boxing great may momentarily be down for the count, but the count isn't over yet. And so the big question remains, where does Sean O'Sullivan go from here? There were a lot of good times um, and a lot of bad times. The low in my life were always worse than the highs. The low. I always, always, always knew that about me. How's about meeting in 25, you know, again? You got yourself a deal, buddy. And that's it for us tonight. If you have a story idea, just call us at 1-877-TELL-69 or email us at global16by9.com. You can also send us a message on Facebook or Twitter. I'm Mary Garofalo. Thank you for watching. And from all of us here, good night. Want more on tonight's stories? Check our exclusive video on global16by9.com. Sixteen by nine, the bigger picture. That's a wrap.